Welcome everybody and uh, good morning to you all. This is the second webinar uh, from ARC, the Age Reform Coalition. I'm Caroline Cox, I'm the chair of Hourglass, one of the partners of ARC. Um, I'm going to ask Pat Taylor to talk a bit about ARC, its inception and its main purpose, so that you all have a feel for um, what it is we're trying to achieve and then we'll talk later about the programme that we're going to go through today. So Pat, would you like to um, Thanks, tell Harley. everybody about ARC? Thank you. Um, so th this is a very personal journey. So uh, for me, um, my mum went through uh, nine care homes in 18 months, caught COVID twice, was evicted, uh, broken back, broken wrist. Uh, and rather than just sort of accepting that situation, um, I did a lot of research and was extraordinarily frightened by what I found in the care home sector. Um, in essence, um, th this is a very controversial statement, but um, if there's anyone evil out there who wants to torture people, go and work in a care home. Um, that's not dispersing care workers, but it's just, the, it's like the Wild West out there. What I also discovered through the research was that um, there's a lot of good organisations out there, but they're all duplicating efforts. So they're all doing very similar things in, to different standards, which isn't a very efficient way of working. So we, we, I, 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 the, the big sort of takeout for me was we need to get together and form a, a bigger critical mass of organisations that is organised and offering a total solution, starting with the care home sector, um, because that's um, something that's of interest to at least three of the organisations. Um, and uh, I approached um, uh, Richard, CEO at Hourglass, who very kindly embraced us um, because we, we needed someone with a voice in the sector uh, and a, a relatively large uh, charity within that sector. Um, and um, for us, um, Age UK sort of dominates this sector. Uh, and um, whilst they do a huge amount of good work, I, I think the government needs to listen to more than one voice and more than one perspective, and maybe some people who are fresh into this area and got a bit more energy and a few more ideas. So uh, I, I've got a Venn diagram of how art works, but think of it as a Venn diagram where we're trying to offer a total solution for care homes initially, but then also with the ultimate goal of forming an all-party parliamentary group on safer ageing, uh, and also a minister for elders uh, within England. Those are our ultimate objectives. Uh, I've talked enough. I shall hand back to Caroline. Thank you. Um, I'm sure as the morning goes on, you will get a better feel as well, or a bigger feel of um, what, every, what the component parts are. Um, I want to ask the panel, without further ado, to introduce themselves. They can do a far better job than I in terms of putting forward why and who they are, why they're here and who they are. So I'm going to go around my screen. There's no order particularly, um, but I'll start with Felicity. If you would introduce yourself, Felicity, to the people that have joined today. Um, I'm Felicity. I have over 18 years experience as a healthcare assistant within the NHS community and care home settings. Um, I was dismissed from my job for raising concerns um, of health and safety concerns, offering solutions. Um, I think the term was I was classed as a nuisance, so I was fired um, and from there I have set up along with Elizabeth Fox, Nightingale's Army, to raise the standard of care. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Sean. Yes, good morning everybody. My name is Sean Keep. Um, I have uh, about 30, 34 years service in, in the Met Police, um, uh, managing uh, very serious investigations. Um, I left the Met Police in 2015 uh, and I've, since that time I've sort of been specialising in, in safeguarding, uh, safeguarding consultancy work. Uh, which took me down to Surrey Police where I worked there and I uh, reviewed a number of safeguarding um, <laughs> serious failures, let's say, in the in the in the in the uh, care um, care sector, uh, and what we found was um, in very many of those cases, sixty five to seventy percent of those cases, staff knew things were going wrong and couldn't speak up. And from that point on, uh, I formed a company with a, my business partner Paul Adams called Say So, um, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. But basically, I've been a safeguarding professional since twenty fifteen. Um, and my whole goal with, with uh, what we're doing is trying to get care providers to listen more to their staff, because ultimately 
they've been recruited, they've been trained, they've got a lot of experience, they have all the information, why don't you listen to your staff is basically where I'm coming from, okay. Brilliant, Sean, thank you. Sabina? Hello everybody, good morning, I'm Sabina. Um, I am a nurse, I've been a nurse all my working life. Um, I've also been very involved in the adult social care sector, I sit on government bodies, I've sat on CQC for two years, um, and I am really passionate about carers uh, being treated fairly, the professionalization of the care workforce, um, the perception of the public towards adult social care. And I do a lot of lobbying. Um, yeah, and I've run, I've managed care homes myself, and I've been a director of operations for a domiciliary care company. Wonderful, thank you, Sabina. Paul. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Paul Rylance. I'm the CTO of JKM Care Solutions. Um, we have about 20 plus years frontline experience in NHS, adult social care, and enterprise scale uh, technology. Um, we're deeply passionate about patients, their journey, their safety, and we have multiple years experience in adult safe care. Brilliant, thank you. Pat, is there anything else you wanted to add to, to your initial introduction about ARC? Yes, yeah, so our, our organisation is BCHS, Better in the Care Home System. Um, so myself and some lifelong friends have got together and are particularly looking at financial transparency, which happens on Friday, that's all. Wonderful, thank you. And just a bit about um, Hourglass, uh, in that it's the only UK-wide charity that's seeking to call out abuse and neglect um, of older people. We have a helpline, we've got various community hubs, um, but our, our mission currently is to uh, work towards a safer ageing agenda and a fairer society for um, older people. Uh, I've been chair for two years. My own background was um, both in uh, trade union working in the public sector, particularly social care, and uh, moved over, as some might say, poacher term gamekeeper, or the other way around indeed, uh, to full-time HR in the same sector. Uh, okay, what we're going to do today, the, the webinar is going to go on until half past 11. Uh, we've got a presentation from Sean uh, about Say So. And then we've got a series of questions that have already been submitted uh, to us that I will uh, go through and ask the panel to ask, or ask individually. There's provision for participants who are watching the webinar to ask questions. We will seek to um, introduce those at a in a timely way if we can. Um, they will be flagged, if not, by uh, Penny, who's from Hourglass. Uh, and we hope that uh, you can engage with us and be sending us uh, questions and your thoughts using the provisions on on Zoom here. So uh, shall we get on and uh, hear from Sean, if you could, okay. Sean. Sean's going to share, share my screen. screen. Yeah. If this works. <laughs> oh, can you see that, guys? Uh, yep. I see part of it, yeah. Yep. Yep, wonderful. Is that fully on the screen or all of let's, let's see? Uh, uh, you need to go to slideshow, I think. I'm just pressed on, there we go. How yeah. about that? Yep. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. So this presentation, safe care, best care. Uh, I think the two go together at the end of the day. You can't have good care without it being safe. It's, it's things that go together. Um, I'm just trying to. Oh, there we go. So look. Um, you know, I'm not going to try and just read this off the screen. I just want to tell you a little bit of a history that, you know, uh, I alluded to in, in my introduction in as much as um, I was asked to review um, 125 uh, care failures um, that were referred to the police in Surrey uh, between, I think, about 2010 to 2015, for five years worth. So about 20 odd a year for that county. Um, what I found was when we reviewed those investigations was around 65 to 70% of those cases, if you track back in time before the actual uh, event of serious, serious care failure, staff in that care home or in that care scenario, they knew things were going wrong. Um, 
but they just didn't feel comfortable, confident uh, about speaking up. And and for me, that that sort of, you know, um, raised a, an issue of this. This can't be right. This, this 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 we've got to be able to do something to make make staff feel comfortable. And we try to drill down into the reasons why staff wouldn't speak up. And and I've listed them here. Okay. Um, yes, they, they're they're very worried that they'll be identified. So even if they try to report um, anonymously or confidentially, if they pick up the phone and speak to their head of care or head of HR, which is usually what's in place in most care homes. So there's a poster on the wall. Their whistleblowing policy is speak to head of care or head of uh, head of HR. Um, just even the, the you know the, the the recognition of their voice or the description of the circumstances where they work they feel they could be identified even if they try to report things anonymously um and and emails addresses you know email the head of hr if you want to report something um obviously you're going to have to you'll leave a trail of your own email if you try to do it that way so people don't want necessarily always to be identified they they sometimes want to they, they often want to report stuff but they don't want to to be identified because um they you know, top of the tree, they fear, as as um, Felicity was saying, they fear their job is at risk. They fear they'll be victimised, bullied, etc. Um, you know, or they'll be marginalised, and they could eventually lose their job and find it very difficult to get another job. Certainly locally, because people will have a will, will understand, or you know, word of mouth will 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 be that um, you know they're a troublemaker, as you were saying, Felicity. So, um, and I think there's a. In the care sector, with 80% of care staff being female, I think there is a, a bigger um, uh, risk that they face uh, than, than in any other sector, because many of the carers are ladies who have perhaps had families and have gone back to work. And, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm only giving you a percentage of uh, what I think. Um, many of the uh, ladies who have had families go back to work, uh, perhaps after 10, 15 years, and they have lost touch with the skills that they once had perhaps when they were working before they had a family. And so they feel trapped in the care sector in as much as they're great carers and they're great people working in the care sector, but it will be very difficult for them to find a job elsewhere, okay? Um, so that to me ratchets up the fear because they think, oh my, my goodness, if I speak up and I get the sack and then I'm blackballed, it's very difficult for me to get a job. So I think actually in the care sector, there's a bigger risk uh, and a bigger fear factor, okay? Um, yes, they will be treated differently by their colleagues. They will be subject to a scrutiny of an investigation and some people don't want that. They, they don't want to be, you know, witness A at, 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 in a court. Um, you know, um, they don't want to be whispered about in the staff room. They don't want finger pointing about, oh, it was her or him that spoke up or it was her that, that caused all this fuss. Um, and again, people now, we're, we're all living in higher stress um, situations than ever. And adding to their stress levels is something that a lot of people just don't want, okay? Um, so coming to the, to, to the end of this, this little uh, slide, um, I, one, one um, example really exemplifies what I think uh, we're trying to avoid is I, part of when we set up Say So, um, we did a lot of consulting and, and I spoke to a, a, a lady, a female uh, carer who said, oh, I wish Say So was in place in a care home that I worked in three or four years ago, she said, because at the time my husband had lost his job. I was the only um, breadwinner of the family and things were going wrong at the care home and I wanted to speak up, but uh, not only was there a toxic environment at work that you know, I realized it would be difficult to speak up, but also my husband was saying, for goodness sake, don't speak up, don't, don't do, do anything to lose your job, otherwise we'll have no money coming into the household. Mm -hmm. So there was stress at work and stress at home for this lady. And she said, I couldn't sleep for weeks. You know? Now, if there was a facility for her to speak up safely, confidentially, and uh, so that she would have trust in, then she could do that and then sleep at night at the end of the day. And, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a real, I think there's a real problem in, in the care sector around speaking up. Um, and so moving on to the next slide, what, what is the result of all that? The result is actually that there's missed opportunities, okay? Um, and this is something that we are trying to get across and uh, to, to more and more care providers that actually by 
by not having a good speak up policy and process in place, you are missing opportunities that could prevent serious care failures, quite obviously, uh, to improve the care delivery, because, you know, uh, why wouldn't you listen to your staff if they've got a particular view about how care is delivered? Uh, you're missing opportunities to identify learning and identify early opportunities and uh, early interventions. Um, obviously, you, you, you're missing opportunities to, as I say, challenge and confront poor conduct. Um, and one of the things that care providers I don't think understand is if you've got a good speak up policy and everybody in that organization knows how to report, and in fact, we do a particular thing where we give actual cards out to people so they've got all our contact details and they can put it in their wallet and their in their handbag or whatever. If everybody knows that every staff member could confidentially or anonymously raise a concern about themselves, then actually it's a big deterrent factor. It's a big deterrent. Um, and obviously to identify and investigate criminal behavior. I've been a police officer for 30 odd years and many of my most serious cases started off with anonymous information at the beginning. So, uh, you know, it is quite powerful as long as you get the right information out at the end of the day. And what we do believe is that once you get people into a position where they are, they feel safe and they feel confident about speaking up, either through their line management or through a, a, a process like, like ours, then you are tackling the toxic culture and you're breaking down that toxic culture that people feel comfortable to speak up and report things and have that open conversation. Okay, so the solution we think care staff must be able to speak up without fear of any consequences and and uh, and as i say my, my business partner and i have designed uh, say so to address all of those matters we are independent we are impartial we're a third party um, and we can offer our expertise from our police background around how we keep uh, information safe we call it in law enforcement having a sterile corridor in other words if someone wants to report something to us uh, anonymously or confidentially we won't pass on anything that, that could identify them, but we will pass on the, um, the, the core matter that needs to be addressed. That's, that's, the, that's what we're interested in. What is the core information? Okay. Um, and it's just going on. Uh, okay. Oops. Right, I wanted to show you this. So this was a, this was a piece of work done by uh, Sydney Yoshida, back in about in, a, in looking at corporations in Japan, but it's very similar situation across the world. He did it, I think, in the, in the 1990s. And what he was saying is the research that he, done, he, he did, and he was a, a professor in a university in Japan, he's saying that 100% of all the problems, as we see there on that slide, are known to the people the operate, at the operations level. But as you get a larger organizations, those, that information gets refined and refined and diluted or, and reduced so that the people at the top, potentially the people who are making the ultimate decisions around some of these risks, they only know, he's saying they're 4% of the information because it all gets screened out by the time it gets to them. When you, when you think about it, who's going to tell their boss, oh, something's going wrong? Quite usually it's, oh, everything's all right, boss or ma'am or, or, or gov or whatever. Um, it's very difficult sometimes to, to actually relay that actually something is going wrong. So that you can see how in many large organizations it's screened out. We think that if you have a good speak up policy, you can get that information from the bottom right to the top. And that's a quite, uh, a, a, I think it's quite an innovative suggestion because in many organizations that I know of, and certainly the, 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 the police service, it was very much frowned upon that you shouldn't go direct to the top actually. It was, oh, you speak to your own line manager, which again, suppresses information. So coming to the end then, um, our solution is that, that care staff must be able to speak up safely without fear of consequences. And actually, if, they, if, that, if you can make that happen, um, that everybody's safer. The care staff themselves, the, 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 the vulnerable people themselves, uh, they are all um, in a much safer uh, environment and also, it helps to keep and maintain care standards. Um, and that really is, is my presentation, guys. Um, that's really what I wanted to say. Um, is there any, are there any questions uh, from the panel, first of all, around anything that I've said around that? 
No, I think we've got a series of questions coming. Okay. I'll stop sharing that then. <laughs> okay. Okay, that was really good. Thank you. I think it's worth remembering that our underpinning um, aim is to ensure that we have happy, safe residents or vulnerable people living in their homes and that that is our driver as well as the things we're going to be talking about today. And to that end, our first question that we've received is, how do prospective care home residents or domiciliary care users, and or indeed their families, choose a safe care provider for their needs? If I can start with uh, you, Pat, that would be great. Thank you. So yeah, I, I've alluded to my mum's story. Um, so I, I, I became rather an expert <laughs> at this almost by default in terms of nine care homes in 18 months. Um, uh, and, and it was very, it was a, a learning process. So the, the, the three main things that I've come to the conclusion uh, in terms of advice for people is um, go and visit the care home and try and get a feel for the culture of the place. So talk to care workers who work there, see what sort of response that you get. Um, you'll get very quickly a feel for the culture within that care home. Obviously, talk to the managers and staff, but they're there to, to put their face on and, and, and you know, sell, sell a bed to you. Um, so really try and get a feel for the culture. The other thing that I did was um, ask the people in the, in the know. So um, um, nurses, uh, in, in occupational health, social workers. Um, I got the answer, oh, I'm not really supposed to say because I'm not allowed to show bias, but... You know, this is where I would go if it was my mum. So, you know, people will generally know if they work in that profession, what the best care homes are in your particular in your particular area. Uh, and then finally, reviews. Um, it amazes me that people use TripAdvisor to review a meal um, um, and don't think twice about it. But it seems like there's a dearth of information in terms of reviews from users, families um, out there. Um, uh, and so uh, to a certain extent, the British public needs to take a bit more responsibility and also have a platform where the care homes aren't actually paying for those reviews uh, or, 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 the, or the provider of that platform, something that's actually independent and you can rely on something like Trustpilot, Glassdoor in terms of ex-employees. That would be my uh, advice uh, um, in terms of the three things that, that became most important to me. Brilliant. Thank you. Sabina? do you think? Um, I will build on everything that Pat said. Um, my experience, when I was a senior sister, if I was placing someone in a care home, um, even though I wasn't paid for this, I would go to that care home myself and visit um, because I felt it was really important to place someone safely. Um, I would also advise to be very wary of websites and that is not to... Um, put down care providers advertising. However, the marketing is to sell a bed and the website can often appear much more gorgeous than it actually is. So to agree with Pat, you have to view the home yourself. My <clears throat> experience again is dealing with people that when their family it's a really difficult decision it's a very emotional decision it's a very guilt-laden decision to put your relative into a care home at, at this point the families are usually in chaos they do, and I have dealt with chaos with families um, and their relatives for 20 odd years and the chaos will be they just don't know which way to turn and this is probably the last option. So an example of this would be a dementia <clears throat> patient who has become increasingly bedbound. The families who are unpaid carers find that they are caring 24 seven and have no life of their own. So apart from it being an emotional decision, um, the families are also exhausted. So uh, going back to looking at the website, be careful. Um, as Pat quite rightly said, go and view it first. You will, your intuition will tell you what the culture is like. But I would also add, if you've got a friend or a colleague or someone in the know, like a nurse 
or um, anybody um, who can go with you because they will ask questions that you haven't got a clue about. So I would ask questions like, do you actually charge for palliative care? And often the answer would be yes, which shocked me. I would ask them what their tissue viability rates, how many pressure stores do they have in their home? So having someone to help you will broaden the perspective of your questioning. That's a good point, thank you. Sean. Yeah, um, I, I echo everything that's been said uh, already. And, and, and a lot of this is, is a gut feeling, I think. Um, but yes, visit, visit, visit quite frequently, a few times. Don't just visit once um, before you, you know, if you're choosing a care home for a loved one, uh, it's a very important decision. And, and I don't think it should be taken lightly. Uh, I think you should do some research, um, obviously Google the care home, see if there's been any anything in the media about uh, poor care or, or issues, et cetera, arising. The CQC reports, um, uh, as much as uh, there must be a regulator and the CQC, I'm sure, do their best, uh, I, I wouldn't rely absolutely entirely on CQC reports because some of the inspections that I've heard about are sometimes very superficial that they do. Um, uh, so, but, 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 but please have a look back at the, the current CQC report and any previous that um, they, you know, that they have to publish and, and, and in fact you'll find it on the CQC website and the current one you'll find on the Care Home website, of course. Um, I would even talk to and, uh, you know, ask the staff, you know, some, some fairly pertinent questions, as Sabina was saying, you know, how many, um, you know, Section 42 inquiries have, have been raised from that care home, how many safeguarding alerts or whatever, and, and ask them specifically, well, what has been learned from that? What changes have come from that? Are they, are they actually open enough to say, yes, we, had a, we have a few problems. If you go to a care home that says, no, no, you don't have to worry about that, everything's fine here, then I think, I think that you, you, you take the view that they're trying, trying to gloss over things rather than actually tell you some detail around, you know, what they have learned. Um, because um, I, I did some work this morning uh, and uh, the current situation is that there was a, something like 161,000 Section 42 inquiries um, in the last, or well, the last accounting year, which was 2019 to 2020. Um, so, uh, if there's let's say 13,000 care homes and there's 161,000 section 42 inquiries and your care home is telling you oh we haven't had any um, I think uh, you know that you, you might you might start, start to doubt that so I think most care homes probably a few times a year will have some something that goes wrong that needs to be inquired into and will they tell you about it if that you think they're being a little bit uh, closeted and, and cloaked uh, around what they want to tell you about it, then it might start to ring some bells for you. So I think, yes, Sabina's right, ask some pertinent questions around, you know, what is the situation about safety? What have you learned? How have you, how have you uh, dealt with some of those issues that have been raised? And what changes have you, have you put in place? Um, but yes, everything you said so far is, 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 is really good. Um, what measures are in place to keep vulnerable people safe? Um, are there um, door alarms, for instance, pr pressure mats for, for people getting out in, in the night or, or whatever? Is there CCTV? What is the reporting process? Clearly, I'm very interested in reporting processes, but is it, if it's just a poster on the wall, ring your head of HR, um, ask the staff, has anybody used that? Do, do, do they use that uh, regularly? Do they have confidence about using it? I think talking to the staff is very important and you'll get a feel about how safe it is there. Right, thank you, Sean. Felicity. Um, I think what we all need to remember firstly is that when you're viewing a care home, there is protected meal times, protected personal care times, protected, protected, protected everywhere. You will never get a full representation of what an actual day to day, what it's like day to day in a care home because there are only certain times one can visit. There is a tool on our website which can help you look through and show you what to look out for. Um, but generally, there are sites like Indeed where healthcare assistants do have a voice. They do put their opinions on there of where they've been working, what they've experienced. Um, we always encourage um, anybody looking to put someone into a care home to view this site because genuinely we're the ones that are on the floor day to day working as closely with the residents as possible. So our voice, as much as it isn't heard, is the most important one to be listened to. So we encourage everybody to, to look on Indeed when looking at reviews for care homes. We don't encourage people to look at 
um, actual websites of care homes because they fund their own websites. They make them look as pretty as possible, um, which is pleasing to the eye. Um, and we're all like magpies when it comes to things like that, fixtures and fittings. We're like, oh, that's pretty. My mother would, would love that chandelier. She would love it in here. The decor's lovely. But actually that is just covering up what really truly goes on in these places. Um, I would really look at space when you're going into a care home, look at the rooms, ceilings, anything where you feel, you know, even if your relative doesn't need um, aids at the time, like stand aids, hoist, etc. Um, so they could be put into a small room. The chances are generally down the line, they will need to be using these equipment. So the room size needs to be something that you take into consideration. Also, when viewing a home, um, a lot of the time, the person showing the relative or family member or resident around the home will be promised a lot of things, baths when they want them, um, you know, trips out, um, whenever they want to go in the garden, they can go in the garden, but this just isn't realistic. We are running floors with short, short staff shortages all the time. We try our best to get to a resident and to be able to deliver the care when needed, but it's not always possible. And I think we need to be a bit more realistic about what we're promising people when they're coming in. So again, on our website, we underline all the things that we are not able to do when promised and why we are not able to do it. So therefore, it's going to give um, anybody looking at care homes a realistic um, expectation because a lot of people are disappointed when they come into the care home. They're getting let in and they're promised all these things and when they're not delivered, they're let down and they feel, oh, we must, we must move our relative, we must move to a different care home, but actually it's gonna be the same wherever you go until we tackle staffing, until we tackle speaking up, we're not going to get anywhere and nothing is going to improve so I think it's just about being realistic about what you're expecting when going into a care home. Brilliant thank you I've got Paul then I'll go back to Sabina. Um, yeah I, I can only um, walk in the shadow of everybody else's comments to be quite honest and, and sort of distill um, some of those comments made uh, and I think the, the underlying concern for most people who are putting a family member in care is, is it a good place? Is it a safe place? And will, will um, our relatives be, be looked after? And those three fundamental questions are pretty much underpinned by everything that's been said already. And I think Sabina touched on a really good point. Um, we need clarity of information. So... If, if you're going as a, as a lay person to a care home and, and you're being told things that are outside your sphere of knowledge, then it would, it would be in your best interest and, and the interest of the patient going into care um, that they have um, somebody with equal experience and knowledge. And that may mean um, seeking the help of a professional. It may mean going to um, adult social care, the local authorities, say, do you place people in this care home? Have you had any reports? Have you had any concerns raised? And that just paints a richer picture uh, for the people to be able to make a, a sensible and, and informed decision. And, and I think, you know, from, from Sean's presentation, um, the information gathered from informal uh, feedback from people raising concerns. And that's not just concerns from professionals. That may be concerns from patients. That may be concerns from relatives. And all those um, pieces of input go to paint a, a much richer picture than for somebody looking to place uh, a relative into care. Brilliant, thank you. Sabina, you wanted to come back? Yeah, again, I um... Two things, so I build on what Paul says, but I would also like to add, are their relatives going to be happy? So it's not just all about safety, it's are they going to fit in? Are there people to talk to? Are there activities organized for them? Are they going to be happy? Um, because as I explained before, it's very guiltly. One of the worries will be, oh, I really don't want my mum to be miserable. Um, the other thing um, I'd like, so 
two points, social services as well. Do remember um, that they will talk honestly to you, but at the end of the day, they need a, that placement. And if someone can do it privately, even better, because the lack of finance for funding domiciliary care is getting worse and worse. So, um, you know, there may be a veiled kind of answer because they, do, they need to not pay for the care at home for the relative anymore if they can help it. And the third point is to Sean. Sean, can you explain to people what Section 42 is, please? Yeah, Section 42. <clears throat> oh, am I on? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Section 42 of the Care Act is, uh, I noted it this morning actually, where there is reasonable cause to suspect that an adult, A, has some care needs, B, uh, is experiencing or is at risk of abuse or neglect, and C, as a result, is unable to protect themselves. So that is an inquiry that is raised from the care home or uh, by anybody really, uh, goes to the safeguarding board, um, but what, what I feel um, frustrates me around this is the majority of the time, the care provider themselves are asked to investigate. OK, so something goes wrong in a care home. Section 42 inquiry is raised. The safeguarding adults board do not have the resources to investigate every one of these. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, 161,000 a year in the UK. So what do they do? I would say 95%, 99% of the time, it goes back to the care provider to actually report. So the point I was trying to make around that, Sabina, was um, you know, ask the care providers what, what has happened, how they've investigated and what the outcome is. And if they are open with you and are happy to explain, yes, some things do go wrong and this did go wrong, but this is what we put in place to prevent it going wrong in the future. That is a better answer than, oh no, everything's fine here. You don't need to worry about that. You know. Brilliant, thank you. Something that occurred to me was that it, um, going to look at care homes is easier. And part of the question was about domiciliary care providers and how you can ensure that um, you're choosing a safe provider to go into your resident, your family member's home. That feels to me a little bit more difficult. Has anybody got any thoughts about how we can ensure that that is safe for our family? Anybody thought Sabine? Yeah. Oh, well, from from my point of view, uh, from a from a police background, um, obviously you will go to the, um, the 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 domiciliary care provider. Uh, there's one locally that's got a shop in the high street. You can walk in there and talk to them. Um, all of their staff should be DBS checked, so should have the uh, you know the the, the the very stringent checks around um, uh, you know what, what, checking into their background so that they are. Uh, nothing that such makes them unsuitable for the work um, it, and just discuss with them uh, the, the, the sorts of training and the sorts of um, experience that they have and, you know, ask them to uh, introduce perhaps some clients and families of clients that they, they, you can talk to around what care is delivered. I think you've just got to make, make yourself busy around trying to get as much information as possible about how they do their work. Um, getting feedback again. Uh, I love that idea from, Felicity, the, the Indeed work, you know, um, uh, recruitment agency, uh, there is feedback there from staff perhaps who have left the agency before and, and are able to, to report some critical things uh, that, that could be on that Indeed website for you to look at. So that's a great idea. That's what I would say. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sabina and then Pat. Um, again, having run um, a domiciliary care company for two years, um, I would always advise the person to not just, again, we're going back to chaos, we're going back to, I can't manage my mum anymore, she's really needing care, and it's all very emotional. Um, I would never advise, I would talk to them over the phone, but I would always invite them into the office to discuss so that they can see the setup, they can see how the office is run. Um, one has to be careful because of GDPR about other resident, other people talking, there might be an issue there. Um, again, take someone you know to ask pertinent questions, the same questions you would ask with the care home. Do you have anybody with pressure sores? What do you do when something goes wrong? The same 
set of questions. Um, you will be talking to the manager usually and not the owner, although sometimes the owner. Um, again, use your gut instinct, take someone with you, use that instinct. Am I comfortable with this manager? Now, there may be times when people go in and they think, you know, I just, I just don't like her. This place is for my mum. Their instinct has told them that they're not comfortable with that manager. Um, again, as Sean always says, look up CPC reports. Um, there are two swings of the pendulum with this because sometimes, as Sean said, they might be not as thorough as possible. There are many times, and CPC are, are in the process of change when they're really very, very draconian to draconian. Um, so do all the things you would do with a care home. Um, Ask to talk to some of the carers. And this is what I, I would bring in a few carers into the office and they would say, we have a client who's this, we've made this difference to her without naming or, or identifying it in any way. Um, when you look at them, you can see whether they're happy in their job. You can see whether they're passionate or not. Or you can see if they're just giving lip service. So ask to see a couple of the carers. It really, really worked. And especially because what was wonderful was they were sharing stories. <coughs> so for instance, you know, they bought paints for a lady who used to paint and gave up and now they're encouraging her. So they're sharing narrative, they're nurturing narrative and they're sharing stories which can only enhance trust. Okay, thank you, Pat. Yeah, um, it's, it's sort of just building on how Sabina finished, um, that my mum and dad had um, domiciliary care for, for about 15 years. And um, I think one of the things that we noticed was um, if those agencies send a different person every time, uh, then that certainly says something in terms of turnover. It means there's no empathetic relationship formed. Um, and I mean, what we found was um, we, we got to a situation where basically the same three girls came in. They all had a great relationship with mum and dad. Uh, and that then worked extraordinarily well. They almost became part of the family. Um, so, yeah, I think that's very important to, uh, as well. OK, thank you. Sabrina, I see you've got your hand up. There's a question. I don't know if you've um, answered that, Sean, uh, in terms of the Section 42. Have you yes. seen that? Yeah, I saw it. I've just answered it. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it's quite correct uh, what the question uh, was saying, that were all of those 161,000 that I mentioned, Section 42 inquiries, were they all in the care settings? I think it's it's around 50% that are actually in the care, uh, in the service users' own homes, okay. but that could still be something to do with domiciliary care. But nevertheless, uh, with the you know tens of thousands uh, I think it would be unusual for a care home to say, well, we haven't had any for, for, for some time, or at least they would know of one recently that they could talk about. Um, I, I, the, the numbers for me are just too large for, 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 for a care home to say, yeah, we, we haven't had any of those at all. So um, that, that was my point, really. Yeah. We, we've got other questions. Spina, is there something extra that you want to add to that? Yeah, I just think also we need to remember that not all domiciliary agencies are private, that there's a lot of local authority care going out on out there where people do have to pay for. They think it's free. It isn't. Um, and you have very little control with local authority. It is... It is really, really challenging. So as um, Pat said, you will get different people every single day because they haven't got the staff. They haven't got the financial resources to pay them well. And you will have different people going in and out of your home every day. Now, again, you can ask the questions like, I'm sure they have to be DBS trained and whatever, but you have less control than if you are paying money. And it's quite hairy, some of the situations that happen. Um, and this brings me on to a huge um, thing about local authorities and accountability. There's a okay. lot of work to be done, isn't there, for the city? Yeah. Without really? a doubt, without a doubt. Can we move on to the next, next question now, which is about staff being able to report. And I also, um, to say to people that Felicity will need to leave. She has uh, 
lots of stuff to get on and do and her wonderful stuff that she does. So I would like to hear her answer to this question first. How can staff feel comfortable to report matters that concern them? So well, when I first met Sean from SESA, I was completely adamant that this was not needed in care homes and actually management needed to just start listening. But actually, this just isn't the case. I do believe that when members of staff are going for a job or residents are going to want to go into a care home, they should be asking if there is an independent speaking up system in place because actually it is really, really needed. Um, when I spoke up, I the damage that, that caused me, the after effects, I was completely victimized. My character, I suffered with lack of sleep, depression. I struggled to get a job afterwards, all because I was trying to be a voice for the people that I was caring for. So I don't believe that there is a safe way at the moment out there for, for people to be able to speak up at all. I believe that what Sean at Say So is trying to do is wonderful work, to be honest. And I really feel that it should be in all care homes. I believe that it's not just the manager's responsibility to listen, but it's the directors of the companies because actually management are just following what they're taught to do as well. And if it's toxic from the top, it's toxic right down to the core. And um, yeah, I think to be honest, we can't sit there and say there's a safe way. There are lots of people that feel comfortable in speaking up and have the confidence. I'm quite a confident, outspoken person. If I think something and feel something, it just comes out. But there are so many people that I worked with uh, during that time that had so much to say that just didn't have a voice. And they, they then couldn't back me up. And then before I knew it, I was actually singled out and on my own, um, which was a really lonely time, to be honest. Um, mm. So I just feel if you don't believe something is right, if you don't, if it doesn't sit right with you and you don't have the courage to speak up, than to go to an independent person like say so or you know a, a union you have to speak up it's your duty of care to say something when something is not right however you do that however that is right for you as a person because we can't say that everybody is the same because not everybody is going to be able to speak up the same not everyone is the same um so for me personally i just believe that Find your voice wherever you can find it from, whether it's through someone else, whether it's just find it, because eventually you will be heard. You will be heard. Brilliant. Thank you, Felicity. Uh, Sean, Sean. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, you know, from from the work that we've done and, and my experience, it, you know, people um, it, it, there's some research that says that, you know, people who want to speak up sort of naturally naturally migrate to um, someone who is impartial, someone who is outside the organisation, uh, someone uh, where uh, if they do report, um, the agenda isn't immediately changed to protect the organisation, because that's quite often what happens when someone uh, reports something. Um, it goes straight to the organisation um, and they put their stamp on it to say, OK, we've got to protect the organisation, not, not the actual individual themselves. Um, so having that um, independence, that impartiality, that being that external third party, uh, I think is essential to start to sort of break down uh, the barriers and start to make um, uh, people feel, feel safe and confident to, to, to report. But on top of that, you've got to have the expertise and, and some of the, th the work that we do, and, and there are other uh, speak up agencies out there, I'm not saying there isn't, um, but what we do is, is we, we actually um, edit the information because someone uh, or edit the identification information because someone, if they report confidentially or uh, anonymously, they can still give themselves away. They can actually say, well, I was night duty last week and I saw this or saw that or I was unhappy about this situation. And it won't take too long for people to realise who that is. So what we do is, you know, in addition to that, that, that sterile corridor, uh, of not passing the information directly on to, to the employer is, is we actually edit out the information so that people can't deduce who the, uh, who the source is. Um, and once we explain that to staff, 
uh, to, and they realize that they've got a new, huge amount of protection and that even if they decide to be anonymous, um, that is a great weight lifted off their minds because uh, uh, the, the, many of the people, the vast majority of people who work in care do so because they care about the people they look after. And if they know things are going wrong, um, they, they do want to get that information out, even if it is anonymously or just confidentially to us um, without speaking directly to their employer, um, they feel comfortable to do so. Uh, and that is a, a huge weight lifted off their, their minds and, and helps them as far as welfare and their mental health is concerned. So I, I think recapping to how to make staff feel safe is um, yes, protect their identification identity if that's what they, they wish. Um, and we give us give us some make sure that they they get some feedback as well. Um, so many times when we've done our consultation work, we know that people have spoken up in the past uh, through a particular policy or on a whistleblowing policy, and then never heard what what happened, um, and they don't feel listened to. Um, so we 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 try to to um, um, engage with care providers who do want to look at their culture, look at their workplace culture and move it to a position where it is more open, where people do uh, are more willing to speak up. Um, and, you know, that if we can do that and we can improve their culture, what it does is, is provide a sort of a cloak of safety for everybody. If we can improve that workplace culture where people feel either that they can speak to their line management because, um, you know, uh, that is the, 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 new, the new culture that's that's, uh, that's in place, or if they can't, they can speak to an independent agency who can get that information to the place where it needs to go. Um, so once you put all of that in place, staff feel safer and more confident and trust the, 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 the process. Um, you will get more reports effectively. That's what will happen, okay. Brilliant, thank you. I'm going to go back to Felicity because I'm mindful of the time, Felicity, and you put your hand up. Is there something else you want to yes, say? Yes, I just wanted to add that, just quickly, the detriment that it causes when you do speak up and you do lose your job is that after I got fired, because I've done this job for 18 years, I, I panicked because you need your reference from your last job to be able to get a new job in care. So I contacted 12 care um care homes and care in the community a combination after I lost my job um and I was honest with every single one of them about how, why I've lost my job um because you can't go into a new job and not be honest especially when you know full well you're not going to get a reference um because they can actually do that they can they can let you go without a reference which is what they did to me and I didn't get a call back from one care provider and one care in the community after that, not anybody wanted to touch me, apart from one who did touch me. They did allow me to go and work for them. Unfortunately, I couldn't continue the work because by then I was just too, I was just too drained. I just couldn't continue. But that, that, that definitely gave me an insight of how many people out there do not want you to be whistleblowing because they refuse to then take you on. And out of all of the ones I contacted, like I said, only one got back to me, asked me to prove what I was saying, which I was able to do, back up what I was saying, back up what I'd been through, back up the situation, back up the concerns that I had. And they were happy to give me a job because that was the company that wanted that sort of staff. So, but, but that's very far and few in my experience. So I think one thing I would like to say to anybody who is going to raise concerns and who is going to stand above the parapet and say what they think, be prepared that you are going to get knockbacks for jobs after that. Um, but keep going because there are some wonderful care homes and wonderful care providers out there in the community that will take you on for, for being brave. Um, so don't, don't let that put you off. Okay, <laughs> Felicity, I'm, I know you're going to be leaving us soon. Is there anything yes. else you'd like to say um, in, in sort of the broader sense for, to the people listening before you go? Yep, I'm looking forward to continuing working with ARC and everybody involved. I think we've all share share our same views and we're all here to tackle the issues um, that, are, are, that are here and present. And um, we will get there. Watch this space. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you for your contribution. It's been really valuable. You're so, welcome. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye then. Sure, Sean, you have your hand up. Yes, it was just to address that point that uh, Felicity was saying. Um, yes, you know, um, 
that there is a, a poor history about people who stand up to be counted in the care industry. Um, that is why we, we think that it's absolutely uh, important that we, we offer an, an anonymous uh, option for people to remain anonymous or confidential to us. Because um, the, the whole point for me around uh, keeping people safe and speaking up is it's the information that is important, okay? Yes, the person behind that, giving that information, uh, it, it is useful on another level if we want to take action um, on a formal basis, etc. But let's have that information out, even if it's anonymous, if something is going wrong in a care, and this is one of the things that we, when we talk to CEOs about say so, um, uh, they say, oh, I can't, how, how can we deal with anonymous information? And we say, well, hold on a minute. If something's going wrong in your care home, do you want to know about it or do you not want to know about it? And um, that they, that they then say, we then say, well, look, if you want to know about it, sometimes you're going to get it anonymously. But at least you know about it and you can start putting things in place to test whether it's happening or address it in some way through supervision, management, moving people around to get them more visible, etc., or just just a management inquiry. But wouldn't you rather know what's going on? And they all go nod. Yes, of course we would. We, we, we want to know what's going on. Um, so not anonymous information is valuable to both parties. It is valuable to the care provider and it is a valuable way of, of, of bringing that information to the attention uh, by the staff because they can then not be identified ever okay so what Felicity was saying is uh, you know if you do put, uh, put your name to something you could lose your job here we're saying no you, you can be totally anonymous and pass on that that concern we will make sure that you're not identified therefore you don't have to worry about it but at least you've done your duty effectively and raised that issue I just wanted to clarify that Yep, yeah, thank you. Sabina, then Pat, then Paul. <clears throat> I think we really need to look at the bigger picture here, Caroline. We, society on the whole, um, is used to, to quote, you don't grasp. That's what's been embedded into us. You don't grasp, you don't grasp up your mates, you don't grasp up companies, whatever. Um, because of this culture, and I think we've all seen recent news in the police, where <clears throat> people have known of events and deaths have happened because they haven't reported. And it is the same in the NHS. In the NHS, the culture of bullying, I think was, don't quote me, but was one of the highest in the land. Um, but nobody reports. Um, and that's why Say So is so valuable and why I'm so passionate about them, because it gives you that tool to quietly report something. It lifts that weight off your shoulders. Um, we're all afraid, well, I was, um, although I did report to CQC, uh, because you think that, you know, everything is going to come down upon your head. And um, people are afraid of CQC. Um, when I did report some terrible care in the community to CQC, with 10 pages of evidence, Caroline, they did an inspection and it came back as good. They didn't speak to the person that was being cared for. Um, and I had 10 pages of evidence you know, wrong medication, um, wine being spilt on the client's floor and not being cleaned up. Um, and as I said, 10 pages, I spoke to higher people at CQC. I spoke to the inspector. So how that came back is good. Uh, well, Felicity and I, from the last webinar, the boxes were ticked. Were ticked. Um, so again, it's... It's a huge issue nationwide because people are afraid to report. They are afraid of losing their jobs. And this culture of don't grass anyone up is still around. And that's why I think Say So are so brilliant because they're trying to smash through this culture. And they're also trying to protect people who are reporting. Um, and that needs to ripple down. 
if you speak to your line manager, you'll often get, they're too busy to listen to you. They've got other things to do. Yeah, Mrs. So-and-so um, does choke on her food. Have you, have you um, referred it to a certain speech language therapist? Oh yeah, we'll do that. Does it get done? Oh, that's a fair point. Okay, useful points always, Pat. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't use the word grass, I used the word snitch, <laughs> but I, I shall not repeat. Um, I think the important point here is that uh, for, for staff to feel safe, that um, concerns are actually embraced and that organisations walk the walk rather than just talking a good game. Uh, again, th this is why I think Sean is onto something because these are businesses. Uh, in, in some cases, they're not actually care homes, they're property businesses, in effect. Um, and there's going to be a huge light shone in, in this sector over the next couple of years, whilst supposedly money is on, on its way. So, you know, the, the government cannot just throw money at it at one side of the equation and then have a completely inefficient, leaky bucket on the other side. So change is definitely coming. Those businesses that put their house in order and realise that actually economically, because that will be a bigger motivating factor at the moment than any sort of soft skills, but economically it will be absolutely in their interest to get their house in order, then I think um, um, people will actually start to embrace those changes, put them into place, and then you'll gradually build a culture of trust. Brilliant. Paul? Um, yeah, Sabina's touched on a really, really good point. Uh, and uh, sadly, she didn't have the, the time to expand on that, but, but allow me to. So when we look at raising concerns and, and for staff to feel safe, well, let, let's expand that to, let's, let's have everybody feel safe to raise a concern, be that anonymously or not. And uh, it, it will invariably involve some sort of technology. Uh, my guidance to, to staff, if, if somebody tells them, oh, yeah, we, we've got a smartphone app for that, that is not a good approach because there is far too much information that can be gleaned from mobile devices to totally destroy any anonymity. Um, and mobile phone companies can um, reference your position anywhere on the planet at any time. So removing your anonymity through use of technology is not a good thing. And that's why we like um, say so's approach um, because they're not using smartphones and, and, and they're, they're using a, a total blend of, of technology and, um, and, and good old policing experience. But also uh, their approach allows for um, individuals, uh, particularly from felicity states that when everybody raises a concern, they always feel that it's only them. Uh, and, and the confidence is lacking. They feel that they're a lone voice. And, and to some extent, so do families and carers as well. Uh, and that mechanism needs to be turned completely around so that when somebody raises a concern, it's suddenly apparent to them that they're not the only one raising these concerns. And it may be raising those concerns against an individual company or an individual themselves. And they may be blissfully unaware that 10 people have already come forward and expressed concerns about that exact same person or that exact same organisation. And that is an enormous uh, boost to the confidence and, and the, the morality of, of actually reporting. And if I just expand the conversation a, a, a little broader as I close, um, if, if we have somebody who's being abused or uh, financially uh, or, or physically or otherwise, and that person doing the abusing moves on before they're caught, there is nothing on anybody's radar to show that that happens. And, and, and I know this is sort of not care home specific per se, but we only have to look at incidents like uh, the Jimmy Savile affair. And if, if something like say so or any other mechanism was in place, a lot more people would have known 
what was going on a lot quicker and a lot more transparently without anybody having to lose their job or fear of losing their job through lack of anonymity. And I, I'll, I guess I'll close it there because I could open quite a large Pandora's box. Oh, well, the whole issue is a massive Pandora's yeah. box, really, <laughs> Paul. So, um, Sean, uh, Sarah Brown, who's one of the trustees of Hourglass, has asked if uh, Say So operates across the whole of the UK. Yes, we do. And, and not just so in the She's care. from Northern Ireland, yeah. Yeah, not just in the care sector. In fact, we've got uh, three contracts with fire services now who are very oh, interested to, uh, to, to, to have their staff uh, engaged and feel included. Uh, and that's another issue is, is um, what better way to say to your staff, look, we want to listen to you by actually putting something in place that enables yeah. them to feel comfortable to be listened to, you know? If I was still a HR director, I would contact you, I'm sure, definitely. Excellent. Well, let's talk afterwards. Of on. course. I think I think we've got some stuff to share. Um, one of the key issues is we've talked about what individuals can do, but it's really important for us to perhaps look at what um, care providers can do. So what needs to change for the majority of care providers to really want to hear their concerns? What do they need to do to shift their thinking? So. Is it the money? Is it about money? Is it about reputational damage? What is it about? So I'd be keen to hear from all of you uh, what you think um, needs to change for the care providers to, to want to hear this, these issues. Uh, I'll start with Pat. Sorry, wake you up, Pat. <laughs> well, my eyes were open. <laughs> um, yeah, um, for me, uh, I think the iceberg that Sean put up, um, uh, that there will be a dawning real realization that as more transparency and more focus comes on this sector, that actually um, the way in which they run their business is a little bit archaic, uh, and that it's it's actually in their interests to listen uh, to what's been said um, by people um, at the coalface. Um, management can't possibly have all the answers. I think it was four percent at the top of the iceberg. Um, I think for me, a particular um, thing is take criminality seriously. You know, to me, that's the pinnacle of whistleblowing. Uh, and as I say, th uh, um, there's no, um, uh, care homes do not take part uh, in the crime survey of England and Wales, uh, along with prisons, uh, which is absolutely unbelievable because apparently old people can't use computers. So, you know, uh, it, it is an absolute black hole. Um, and so to a certain extent, it's easy for the care home system providers to get away with it uh, and turn a blind eye. Uh, but eventually that will come back and bite them in the backside. Um, because to me, that's the top. That's the pinnacle. If you start to get that right, then you, you, you actually start to get, get into help, more health and well-being. But abuse... Um, uh, and neglect should absolutely be top of the tree. The law is not used nearly enough uh, uh, in, in terms of um, corporate responsibility. The law exists in terms of corporate responsibility, but I, I, we can't find a case where it's ever actually being used uh, seriously. So, you know, what was what was the point of it? Um, so there's a, there's a whole host of things um, in, in terms of providers and, and out, outside of that. Brilliant, thank you. How I'm doing this is just going around how my screen presents at each time. So, Paul, it's your turn, please. Oh, fabulous, because I've actually got some <laughs> to add in. And I, and I think um, the analogy painted by Sean and the diagram of the iceberg is really good, um, because their approach and, and the approach of other providers, they're coming from the bottom of the iceberg. They're drilling their way up to the top. And, and organisations, how can we encourage organisations to actually change? Well, they can wait, if they like, um, for say so to drill their way eventually up to a, a level that directly affects them. Or they can start proactively changing. So it, it's fairly straightforward. The, the proactive approach will be to uh, recognise that there is rocks within the industry, the sector. 
and, and proactively do something about it within your own organization and, and seek the help of, of people like ourselves and, and, and um, say so. Or you can sit and wait and take your chances and not change anything. And then it starts to financially affect you. And by then it's arguably too late because your reputation has already been eroded and, and, and you will spend an enormous amount of time and money trying to recover from, from that situation. So I, I think it's at the behest of everybody to, to want to deliver good quality care without trying to hide everything. And the best way for companies to do that is to take the, the forward foot and, and start embracing technologies like uh, Say So Concerns, start addressing some of the internal problems that, that don't need technology. Um, and, and I'd love for everybody to move from the stick to the carrot. But I, I guess the message is that um, walk softly and carry a big stick. <laughs> mm, okay, Sabina. Um, I would firstly start with education. I would bring it in as um, a training requirement into the training of carers um, because it's partly to do with safeguarding. Um, so I would talk about independent report, reporting their options and who else they can report to as well. <laughs> But I would educate on the whole ethos of the importance of reporting. Um, secondly, with the CEOs, I would hit them in the pocket. So I would say, you don't want to be sued. If you don't know what's going on and something disastrous happens, you are liable to be sued which can financially ruin you. Um, again, I would talk about you don't want to lose, you don't want to get a requires improvement rating, which, as we know, really affects finances. People will not go. It's happening now with COVID. The government actually asked that CQC should publish <clears throat> the number of deaths that happened in each individual Home, which was horrendous. So people will look at that and say, oh God, they have 15 deaths, regardless that the NHS discharged 25,000 without testing. Um, but people will look at that and go, oh God, you know, and yet this home only had two. But there are different reasons. One home might be right in the heart of the country. Um, so again, it's about requiring requiring improvement if you don't know what's going on and it suddenly hits you cqc come to inspect and they say well we see this has happened and there's no action for it why cross a box um and i and finally caroline with due respect i will get rid of that piece of paper that ticks a box for cqc that one piece of paper with two lines that says, if you have a concern, contact HR on this number. <laughs> there are different HR directors around, I suspect. There, Sabina, are, but, uh, there you and go. Actually, um, there are some wonderful care homes <laughs> and there are some wonderful yeah. care companies. So I don't want to tar them all with the yeah. same. Okay, but but clearly um, there are some where it isn't how we would want it to be. Sean, I'm going to call you in, but um, we have a comment from Juliet Osborne, Osborne who's listening. Yeah, uh, I yeah. worked on culture change around behavioural safety in the rail and construction industry. I can tell you this investment and change only came about when the directors were held accountable for manslaughter. Care managers need management and conflict training. So in... So, uh, Sean, would you like to answer about how you go about uh, helping care providers change so they want to hear the concerns of staff and maybe pick up that point as well? Well, the rail industry is very interesting, actually, because there's, there's a company or a process called CIRAS, which I'm sure Ju uh, Juliet Osborne knows all about. But that started 15 to 20 years ago after a, a major rail crash, where actually people who work on the railways have to be inducted into this process of if you see something that is against health and safety or there's a risk, you dial this number. OK, 
uh, and, and effectively the trains stop, okay, until an inspector goes down there and checks that everything's safe. That's how strong they are. In other words, you can't be employed on the railways as a maintenance person until you've had this induction that you know exactly what to do if you spot something that is a risk, okay? Now, wouldn't that be great in the care sector? If you said everybody must know exactly who to call if they spot something of risk, okay? And it's independent, it goes outside, whatever, but hey, everything stops until it's checked and, 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 and investigated and made safe, you know? So um, I see that as, you know, the distant call or a distant aim for speak up services in, in the care sector in as much as staff should be inducted right from the beginning to know exactly how they who they should call if they see a concern and it's about attitude change i think it's about attitude change from the top in any care organization to say that actually you know we've got staff here with years and years of experience and in any care home you will have hundreds of years of experience why aren't you listening to your staff when they have a have a concern you know, you're, you're recruiting them, you're employing them, you're paying their salary, you're giving them experience, and then why aren't you listening to them? So there's an attitude change that I think what's, what's caused the problem in the past, in my view, is the cautious legal approach of deny, 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 deny until it's proven, and then you say, oh, sorry, once it's proven. Um, that seems to be the top level legal guidance around any issue to do with um, uh, an accusation or whatever. Um, and that, I think, has come down into the sort of environment of whistleblowing that uh, care homes and care businesses will try to suppress information rather than admit something is going wrong. Um, and I think once you once you get into a and we've done this ourselves, sat in front of a care provider and talk this through, the initial approach from them is, oh, no, no, we're fine. Thanks. We've, we've got our policy of, you know, if there's a problem, it's, it's a poster on the wall over there. Ring your head of care or whatever. There's a problem. And once we explain to them that actually that is quite ineffective, it is almost, almost fatally flawed, what you need is a guarantee of um, identity being protected, et cetera, et cetera. The lights switch on, actually, and they realise, actually, yes, if we engage more and listen more to our staff, we're actually going to protect people more. And if we protect people, we protect our business at the end of the day. And that's what it's all about. It's getting that understanding and that attitude changed from deny, 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 and only admit something going wrong when it's proved, to actually embracing things, even at an early stage. We, we, when we talk to care staff, we encourage them to say, don't wait till it gets really bad. If you know something is going wrong, report it early. Let's get some early intervention in there and let's get, get it sorted. And what happens is you turn your organization into a learning organization rather than a blame-led organization. So it's about... I think discussing it and, and, and getting that mindset change from the top in care and care businesses, getting that mindset changed of actually it's better to know about something early than something than, than finding out about something really bad when it's too late, effectively. Uh, and that can protect the people and it can protect business. So, again, as I say, uh, and Sabina's quite right, it's about education, educating staff and business managers all the way up that actually it is a good thing for staff to speak up and they should be championed, actually. They should be championed rather than suppressed. Absolutely. Pat, so you put your hand up. Yeah, I've, I've just put, I've put an answer on the phone because very interestingly, we've got um, a barrister and judge as one of the trustees in, in our organisation. He did a paper for us on abuse and, and, and the law uh, because there's a lot of stuff in terms of changing the law here, changing the law there. His conclusion is that the law actually exists. So I think within the, I've got it here, Section 20 and 21 of the Criminal Justice and Courts Act, there is corporate responsibility, maximum sentence of five years in prison. So the, the, the law exists. The problem is evidence. Okay? Mm. It often becomes the elder's word versus the whole care home system, the care home provider. Um, and, and you can imagine how difficult it, that is. I, I've got a civil case going with my mum at the moment, uh, and uh, the solicitors didn't get around to talking to her for her version of events until over a year later. She, she has forgotten a fair few of the details. So the whole system does not treat um, elders, it, it's supposed to treat them as, uh, in terms of special conditions. So they're supposed to do video links and things like that. But um, people do, uh, the, the system does not take it seriously because of that lack of evidence. And I think that's what brings this 
almost complacent attitude from care home providers because they know 99 times out of 100 they're going to get away with it we're, we're advocating that we, we change that. And again, families and friends have to take responsibility. So we're saying you have a mobile phone, you, you have something that can record things. You can put um, hidden cameras within your, within your um, loved one's um, room because it is their space. So legally, you can do that. Um, so you know, that might sound very radical and quite big stick, but I think this is does need to be a combination of, of both of those things, but evidence is the key. Yeah, I've had um, owners or uh, care home managers rubbish the person that has made the complaint and said that they're poor, poor performers um, and that, that who are they to speak and, uh, and I, so I, I, on. So I was evidence, accused, evidence is key. I was, I was so, accused of abusing my mother. Right. As a result of it, I, I was accused by the care provider and they reported me to safeguarding because I reported them to safeguarding. Oh they accused me of abusing the mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, wow. is, this is about reputation damage, isn't it? And, and these are lessons learned from higher up organisations, as Sean alluded to a moment ago. It's cover up, cover up, cover up until you're found out and then say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're sorry. And now we're going to change policy. So I, I think. Uh, getting the right things in place will actually start turning that table uh, and removing the opportunity to assassinate people's characters and constantly cover up. If we can remove that mechanism, then I think the whole um, care industry will benefit the whole. Okay, that's useful. Um, we have a couple of questions. We've got not quite 10 minutes, well, eight minutes, really. Um, one of the questions is about how can care providers ensure that the care is delivered to the standard required consistently? On Monday, we had a debate about registration uh, of carers and standards, and a lot of those issues were covered, but I wonder if there's anything extra that um, anybody on the panel would want to add to that. So about making sure that the standards are delivered consistently. Now, Paul. Yeah, well, I think that the laws and the frameworks are already there to enable people to deliver things consistently. Um, I've got a very mixed um, thought uh, about registration. Yes, registrations are needed, but if they've just become a, a vehicle for a revenue stream, as, as many registrations are, then they're not really fulfilling the purpose except for gathering money from people. So, um, as, as Pat has already said, the law is there, the framework is there, but organisations have the ability and the manoeuvrability to not avoid it, but skirt around these laws. Uh, and they do so because of silence. So it, it, I guess it's all intertwined, and if we can break that silence and start getting the evidence, as Pat says, the data, the information, collated through organisations like Say So, then that transparency itself, I think, provides and reinforces the mechanism for, for the law as it goes. Yes, thank you. Pat? Yes, yeah, so I think the only point that I would add is, um, I think size is important, uh, and in the opposite way, that to me, <laughs> sorry, uh, to me, um, small, medium-sized businesses tend to be family-run, tend to have a better ethos, tend to be able to control a culture if they've got you know, between one and, and, and ten care homes. When you start to get above that number, and it's the same in business, it's extremely difficult to maintain that consistency, uh, and it does become um, much more detached from the fundamental purpose of the business, which is supposedly to 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 um, look after um, elders um, and, and like I say it becomes more like a, a, you know, a, pr a property company um, so I think that is to me it's it, it's it feels potentially a little bit too much like social engineering so that would be the downside but to me there is a certain size above which um, care home managers should not go above uh, because it, it just it loses the ethos of care okay thank you Sean, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yes, a couple of things. Um, one is, um, I do think that um, if you do have an engaged staff, in other words, 
staff that do feel able to either speak to their line managers and, and their internal processes if things are going wrong or they're happy to use a speak up service then what you actually have is another layer of monitoring of what's going on there that you wouldn't have otherwise so because care staff go everywhere they go to the bathrooms they go to the the, the bedrooms they go to their eating rooms they go to the kitchens they go everywhere in the care home so they see what everything cctv for instance could be limited but care staff go everywhere so if you can get them to engage and you make them feel confident about for instance speaking up but also using everything all the all the facilities and all their reporting processes properly then what you have is in addition to your managers your supervisors your team leaders etc you've actually got another layer of of monitoring and that's something that we try to push to care providers to say look are you utilizing your staff as much as you could be and um that's all I would say about how how you can put that other level, another level of, of standards consistency and standards compliance uh, in place effectively. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sabina. Um, I am a strong <laughs> supporter of professionalisation of and registration of the workforce. We need a regulatory body um, that can display accountability, as I discussed in another webinar as a nurse, I have to um, but revalidate every three years that my practice is safe. Um, I'm accountable for my practice and if anything went wrong, I'm held, I am called for a disciplinary um, and my registration could be taken away. So, <coughs> um, also, uh, a manager needs to be hands on. Now, with the recruitment and retention crisis that there is, this is not possible. Um, well, it was in my case, and that was only two years ago. But you need to go out with your carers, like an apprenticeship scheme. You need to supervise them. Supervision is the key. You also need to do spot checks. Um, and catch them off guard to see that nothing is going wrong. But again, as Sean keeps talking about this word engagement, it is engaging with your carer. It's actually supporting them to be a good carer. Yeah. It is overseeing that they are um, exhibiting compliance. It is keeping your client safe, that safe care is being delivered. And it is teaching. Um, and many a time when I went to do supervision, I'd say, well, look, if you look at this, let's have a look at that. So it's education at the same time. Again, liaison with families. It's important that you have that weekly call. How are things going? Any problems? Are you, are you happy? Um, we'll be popping. And, and again, by, by doing the supervision, you'll maintain, you can see how your client is. Are they dehydrated? Are they eating? Blah, blah, blah. Um, but that liaison with the family is so important because you build up trust. And as Pat quite rightly said, many a time, still my clients' daughters and sons ring me and say, let's meet up for coffee. It's the most wonderful feeling in the world. Um, you do become part of the family. You go to the funeral, you do this, you do that, you might go on trips. Um, but it's that initial feedback and keeping in contact. And as Sean says, it's keeping your eye on the ball before anything does happen. So it's also preemptive. Brilliant. Um, it's nearly half past 11. We've covered a lot of issues, not all of our questions. I'm sure we can um, think about another way of dealing with that uh, through the group. I, I have been asked to sum up, but I think the best way to do that is to ask each of you to make a final comment or to say your final point that actually um, encompasses your view around how we can create a safe home environment um, by removing the barriers to speaking up. So if I start with you, Pat, um, what would you like to say as a final thing to the webinar? Yeah. Um... I, th I think from my um, 
perspective, it, 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 it's, it's, it's more about the care home industry realising that a floodlight is coming. And it's incumbent on people like us to make sure that floodlight gets shone as brightly as possible over the next two to three years. Um, so I think from a timing point of view, the window to make the most change is going to be in the next sort of two and a half years before this money supposedly gets injected. So um, um, f- from, my, from my perspective, um, uh, and particularly with a, with a, with a whistleblowing um, bent, um, it will be exactly the ethos of what, what Sean has set up, and, we, and which is why I like it, that um, th- this is not going to do your business any good from a reputational point of view, a PR point of view, a financial point of view, and ultimately survival. And if you can get people to actually be concerned to that degree, then they will do the right thing, and then it'll become endemic in the culture. Uh, and it will just be seen as the normal thing to do. Okay, brilliant. Paul, Sabina, and then we'll finish with Sean. Um, yeah, echo exactly what um, Ant just said. Um, and the light at the end of the tunnel, I think it's at the behest of all um, care organisations to make sure that it's not a train coming uh, and that it is a bright light of, of um, better care, better transparency, and mechanisms like Say So uh, and other initiatives. I, I strongly encourage them to embrace. Thank you. Sabina? Um, I think it's part of a bigger picture again, caring for the carers. The carers will be protected. They will have some of their mental stress taken away from them. So it is caring for carers. Um, And before I go as well, I'm in the process of developing um, a check sheet for people who would like to look at care homes it's free um when i've completed it you can just email me and i will be happy it's got a, a list of questions for you and um you can get my email from caroline and anybody you'd like it once i've finished it you are so welcome to it and you may find it will help and you may find it will spark off further debate and you can discuss that with me at any time. Oh, Sabina, we're, we're going to be trying to ask you to join our coalition. Don't you worry about that. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to go on a charm offensive. <laughs> oh, work, please. <laughs> oh, it's, it's no work. It's no work. No. We, ju- we just listen to you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No, that's fine, Pat. That's it's a good thought. Uh, Sean, can you... Yeah, uh, well, to sum up, I, I, I think... Um, it is, it is about an attitudinal change, I think. Uh, that's what we're looking for. We're looking to sort of, you know, to show and demonstrate that actually listening to your staff actually makes good business sense at the end of the day. Um, who, who wants to wait until there's a whistleblowing serious event? You know, why nobody wants that. Um, and I think if we can actually encourage care providers to say, actually, I'm, I am prepared to shine a bit of light on what goes on. I am prepared to turn the stone and have a little look. Most of what we have been uncovering up till now has been very well and easily managed by experienced managers. It's not something that's so challenging. Um, but what does come up from time to time is those golden nuggets that can really prevent something going badly wrong. And why wouldn't you want to know that? It's just literally uh, a change of attitude is what we're looking for. All right. Okay, thanks. Sabina, you've got your hand up. Just very quickly, um, I think we're uh, putty footing around a bit this as well. Um, let's face it, with um, people not reporting, we've had deaths. Yeah. We've had deaths in the NHS, we've had deaths in, in from victims from a police perspective, a perspective. That is how serious it is. By reporting, you can prevent an unnecessary fatality. Yeah, thank you. A really good place to finish. May I thank you all for your participation, uh, for your valuable input. Um, I've learned, I said on Monday, how much I'd learned from it. And I hope people that have been watching the webinar have been, have learned stuff too and found information that perhaps they didn't have before. The uh, 
recording of this webinar will be on the certainly on the Hourglass website in the next couple of days. Uh, and you can go to any of the websites of any of the organizations uh, listed or who've been involved and find out further information. But my personal thanks to the panel and to Felicity who joined us earlier. Uh, and I think we can finish there. <laughs>